One morning, I was lounging on my sofa. My mom was busy folding our laundry, and some news channel was turned on in the background. I paid enough attention to know that the topic that was being discussed was titled "The Top 10 Careers of 2023 in Thailand." The reporter went on to say more about the ranking, like how it's determined by factors like employment rate, income stability, sustainability, and these facts. And there was nothing particularly interesting. It consists of you, know, I know it, doctors, engineers, entrepreneurs, influencers, the usual. That. Is until it is revealed that fortune tellers also made it to the list. In fact, that wasn't even the craziest part. The craziest part was one point away, and it would have surpassed lawyers in rank. And so it led me to this topic, and it led me to thinking: fortune telling, all these superstitious things and concepts. I thought we all knew they weren't true. I thought we all knew they were founded merely on the basis of beliefs. Then how, and most importantly, why do we allow it to have so much influence in our lives? But before we can answer the complex questions, I think it'd be best to firstly answer or show you how big of an influence superstitions really have on us. First, since I've been living in Thailand for the entirety of my life. I can tell you, for one, that we're a pretty superstitious country. We even have our own word for this, called "sai mu," derived from the word "mu te lu." But it would be narrow-minded of me if I just spoke about Thailand, because superstitions—they come from all around the world. In Japan, if you write someone's name in red, you just curse that someone to death. In America, if you open an You just invited in a bunch of evil spirits. And here in Thailand, if you eat any last piece of food, be it a donut or a pizza, congratulations, you got yourself a good-looking partner. However, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Some countries really do take it to the extreme. Some communities in India, for example, still consume, meaning they eat and drink and bathe. In cow dung, and cow urine, because it works miracles. I drink a gallon of milk daily, so I would say I'm a cow appreciator through and through. But even this has made me question the extent of my appreciation. In Spain as well, there is a practice called baby jumping, where you can infer from the name and from the picture. Men dressed as demons jump over babies laid on to cleanse them from any sin or diseases. So not only do superstitions differ from location and from intensity, they also differ in form. They could go from just sayings or practices like the ones I mentioned earlier to concepts that are much more complex and categorized, like. Fortune telling, and that is also subcategorized into palmistry or crystal stones or crystal balls or tarot cards, black magic, occult, lucky charms. Superstitions have even found their ways into the digital aspect of our lives. There have been shame messages going around and posts with captions like, "Interact three times and your mom will be happy this week." Share this message to the next ten people, and you'll have a good week. Or repost, and <laughs> superstitions have been modernized. They've been adapted to be compatible with time, and they're no longer just traditions or cultural heritage. Surprise, surprise! They're now used as recurring themes for movies and shows, and popularized as trends, and now even a career option. But let's get back into the real question: Why? Why do superstitions appeal to us? Have you ever heard of the phrase "If you don't believe it, don't disrespect it"? 
See, in Thailand, it's a very commonly used phrase, and it basically warns you that if you don't believe in a superstition, you also have zero rights to go around talking badly about people that do believe in it. Because who knows? You might end up regretting it. And this phrase, to be put simply, is very ominous. But it's also the exact we put ourselves through when we encounter superstition. First, we fear. We feel threatened. We feel like something bad would happen if we don't follow along. So we trick ourselves into thinking, okay, if the superstition works, great. If it doesn't, I mean, I'm not losing anything. It's better to be safe than sorry. Because it isn't humanly possible for us to predict or grasp the chances and outcomes of every possible situation we're going to be put in in this life. Sometimes we feel scared and worried and unprepared. This is where the big bad guy fear comes into the picture. And even though this guy's big and he's bad, he has one good trait, and it's that he doesn't discriminate. No matter if you're young or old, rich or poor, man or woman or neither, we're all victims of fear. So how do we cope? How do we tame it so that it doesn't come to terrorize us? Superstitions, our shields. Superstitions empower and they reassure. They make us feel like we have a chance at, at destroying, or at least if not destroying, avoiding these big bad guys. And so whether it be an object to carry or a rule to go by or something that must be said or done, no matter how unreasonable or absurd, we would go through with it. Because at the very least, we have something, some shield, some protector, something we can rely on. How far can this reliance go, though, is another big question that I'd like to tackle. Whether the superstition has a good or bad effect on us depends on how much we allow ourselves to rely on them. Sometimes it can be used for a good cause. Do you have that one friend who is ridiculously good at school? Well, not to brag, but I have multiple friends like that and they're actually in this auditorium right now. And I unintentionally observed this pattern about them and it's that every time exams are approaching, they have this stuff on their social media. A few years ago, it would have been that blue banana. Nowadays, it's this handmade ritual circle that gives the person that posts it on their social media the power to pass all exams. Or it's this feature on Instagram where you post a picture to a caption that already exists. And the caption is always something like school pick or failing finals. And the thing that baffles me is these people that post this, they're the same people 2 a.m. They're the same people that spend their break time voluntarily discussing why dinitrogen penoxide decomposes in a first order reaction with a half-life of at 230 Celsius. They're the last people that need this, so why are they doing all this? Well, this irony works the same way for athletes and their lucky charms. Here's Yuzuru Hanyu, dubbed one of the greatest male figure skaters of all time. And here's his Winnie the Pooh tissue cover that he feels the need to squish before every performance. And here's Ava Samkova and this mustache that she has to draw on her face before every competition. And she's an Olympic snowboarding gold medalist. Why do even the most talented, hardworking people still hold on to things like superstitions. Well, it's because to them, it acts simply as a confidence booster, simply as an emotional support system. They have goals, and they do what they need to do to achieve those goals. The superstitions, they don't interfere. They're here to help emotionally support them and give them the confidence to fully go through with this plan of achieving their goals. And I say this is using superstitions the right way. However, the thing about superstitions is they make it extremely easy to get carried away. And a lot of times, we end up becoming overly dependent. And that's when it gets bad. 
There's many, many ways superstition can be used for the wrong purposes, but I've summed it down to just two common ones that I think you can understand clearly. The first way is when it is used to shift the blame. So there was a true case on the news of a man who was told that if he worshipped this shrine, his wife would get back with him. And because he was so desperate and so alone, he did as he was told, he worshipped this shrine every day for the next month. But do you think his wife got back with him? Well, unfortunately for him, and unfortunately for the ones of you who thought, yes, his wife got back with him, I believe in hard work and hard work. No, his wife did not get back with him. And he went around telling everyone the shrine was a scam and that he was a victim and all this stuff. But it was later revealed that the reason his wife didn't get back with him wasn't because the shrine was a fraud. It was because during the whole time they were together, he was a drunk with a gambling addiction. So whose fault is it really? Another example. Me and my friend were in line at this boba tea store. And we don't usually come here. We usually, we have a store that we're regulars at. But we ended up here specifically because the store that we were regulars at did not have the boba pearls. And if you love boba tea, you know the pain of that. What is boba tea without the boba? Right? Just tea. And so, as we were waiting in line, I just blurted out something because I was allergic to silence. I just said, as a joke, imagine they run out of pearls here too. <laughs> and guess what? They did. And immediately, my friend looked so done. I don't know what she was done with, but it looked like she was done with me. She immediately said, well done, Prah. Good job, you jinxed it. But even if I didn't say that, it's not like the pearls would magically appear, right? But my friend, she couldn't be mad at the cashier, and she couldn't be mad at the boba pearls for not doing their job. So she lashed it out on me and on the act of jinxing. Another way superstitions can be used for the wrong purposes is when it starts to affect the way we make decisions as we go about our lives. So, this is a personal anecdote. Me and my mom have this inside joke turned superstition that every time she washes her car, it will rain. Because for some reason, every time my mom even takes a water hose out or even thinks of wanting her car clean today, it's like the universe wants to see her frown. It's like the universe wants to see her suffer. The sky is always gloomy. And this has happened so many times that honestly, I believe in it too. It's even happened during the summer. And so sometimes she chooses to let her car get dirty to the point that the bird poop from two weeks ago is still in the window shield. And if I experiment by swiping my finger across any part of my mom's car, you might think I got a fourth degree frostbite. Here is a fourth degree frostbite for reference. Another example, there was this auntie that me and my family knew, and she was in this village. And there was a story about her that was being told around. Apparently, one day she decided to visit this famous fortune teller for fun. She asked questions about her love life, her career, her family, her future. And she also asked the dreaded question about her death. She asked the fortune teller, how will I die? And the answer she got back, I don't know much about your death, but I do know that you'll live a short life. You best believe from that day onwards, she was paranoid of everything and everyone that could potentially contribute to this short life of hers. And she lived in fear. And that fear drove her to become even more and more and more superstitious as the days went by, to the point that it kind of became her identity amongst other people in the village. See, when superstitions start making you do things that you normally do and things that you know you shouldn't do, that's where you draw the line. 
There's this unspoken rule in life about moderation, and it applies to everything from the food that you eat to the TV shows that you watch. And it's that everything is enjoyable, but in the right amount. And I think it applies to superstitions as well. You can consume superstitions all you want, but don't ever consume it to the point that it consumes you as well. So we can conclude that there is no science behind superstitions, but there is science behind why we associate ourselves with superstitions. I think of it like this. So I imagine a glass of water and a superstitious object. So the glass of water, whatever reaction is going on with the water, how it's being poured in, being poured out, mixed with some other unknown substance, we can see and we can definitely explain. But whatever reaction is going on with the superstitious object, though, how it's supposed to bring luck, take away luck, give us our desired results, we can't see and we definitely can't explain. What we do know is that we choose to have the trust and belief in this object, and that is enough for us to treat it like it's something important. Ah, so this takes me back to that news channel and to my sofa. This is why fortune tellers made it to the list of top 10 careers. Even though therapists literally exist for basically the same reason, and therapists, they work through science. They methodically help you find the answer to your life problems and seek an answer that would solve, satisfy your question. But we don't want that. We want fortune tellers whose work depends on what is felt and what is sensed. Why? Because we don't actually want problems treated. We just want to be reassured and to find an escape to that fear and to hope someone who will tell us the things that we wish to hear the most. And I'm no fortune teller, but what I would like to say or what to, I would like to tell you in this TEDx talk is that the super in superstitions, yeah, it, it doesn't really exist. But if you'd like to believe it does, then just know the limits, because at the end of the day, the only thing and the only person that can help us achieve what we wish to achieve in this life is ourselves and ourselves. Thank you.